A few months back, I made a little bit more abstract video titled How I Think About Learning, which I will link in a card above. Uh, in response, I got an interesting email, which I have put off answering for literally months until right now. Who are the best five people in tech in 2020? If we're supposed to imitate the best, where are they? Uh, and what's the best place to witness what the best are doing, the best people, best companies? As a continuation of not answering for months, I'm gonna give uh, a really kind of abstract answer, but I, I'm gonna tie it back to reality at the end, I promise. So I will continue to not answer your questions, but hopefully give you better questions to ask as you kind of see the tech industry and all the chaos that that is kind of go by you. So the first thing I wanna clarify is that finding the best for me, when it comes to tech, is less about finding specific people that have done something like, oh, somebody started this amazing company, what did they specifically do? And it's more about finding the ideas and the techniques um, and the, the kind of applications of those ideas that have had the most impact in our industry or that are the most like world-changing for the technologies that we work with. I'm talking about things that have really shaped the conversation and our whole kind of like reality of what we do in tech. I'll give a couple examples in a second. Then as part of that research into ideas, look at the people that came up with those ideas and how they came up with them and why they came up with them and kind of dig into that a little bit. It's pretty easy to see how people are thinking now because usually they are writing blogs, they are giving interviews, um, or they're at companies working on a specific thing that you might be able to see on LinkedIn. Like, oh, what is this person actually kind of implementing in their day-to-day -day life if they work in industry as opposed to academia? I think this first part should transcend time. Like, I don't think there should be a best five ideas of 2020. I think there should just be a really interesting group of five ideas from the last 60 years of computer science. I'll get into that in a second. Uh, we think of our industry as moving so fast and being so chaotic, but in reality, I think technology is largely driven by fads and actually very slow, slow technological process that makes things feasible that weren't feasible before. Um, so a lot of the ideas you hear are fad driven or kind of uh, tech religion driven. There's thing, you know, like the Emacs versus Vim, the the object oriented programming wars. Like the there's so much that is driven by fad, by hype, by uh, and by marketing dollars sometimes, not always. So that's the reason for uh, me encouraging you to to look at historical ideas is because if you have a firm grasp of historical ideas and context, it's much easier to see new ideas as old ideas in new clothing. And then instead of having to memorize 10 million things, you kind of see the principles of those things or where they came from. Uh, and it's just much less to keep in your head because everything doesn't seem new and different anymore. They're all sort of variations on an old idea. And you can say, oh yeah, containers. That's like that virtualization idea from like the mid 1960s. And it's really not that far from the original idea. I'll give you a concrete example. Shazam seemed to me, when I was a kid, uh, you know, incredibly innovative and interesting when it came out. I was like, oh my God, I had just gotten a phone. It's like, I had my first job. Um, I remember just being able to hold up my phone and it would tell me what song was playing. It was miraculous. But the magic that makes that work is <laughs> a signal processing technique from the 1960s. It's fast Fourier transforms. It's a technique that's been used to do all kinds of stuff. And there's a million applications of it. For example, um, you, can do, uh, you can reduce image noise with it. Um, there's, there's so much you can do with fast Fourier transforms. Um, and you know, if you try to memorize a thousand implementations, it just seems very complicated. And when you realize that, oh, there's this idea in math that you know, I think the seminal like FFT paper was written in 1965, and it's been a little bit improved like in the 80s and 90s, but largely it is the exact same idea, the exact same math, um, and it applies to all kinds of interesting stuff. That is much easier to keep in your head than trying to track a thousand applications of this signal processing thing without knowing or understanding that there's a core simple, simple principle at work um, that you can derive all these applications from. Okay, so that's my second kind of big key. So across history, here are some examples, uh, some newer than others, uh, of big ideas that I think are still just 
on fire, super relevant. And I wish people knew more about this and thought of them as uh, really relevant ideas instead of, oh, dinosaurs relegated to the past. Uh, we are still making mistakes that can be prevented by these ideas. And they are, we have not milked them for all they're worth yet. The first is Unix. It's easy to see how this is still a relevant idea. We live suddenly in an age of Linux for the last uh, 20 years or so. Uh, Unix has been uh, continuously developed since the very early 1970s, probably the late 60s um, behind closed doors. Uh, the second thing I would suggest is Smalltalk. The idea of uh, an object-oriented programming language and environment is so interesting. And it's crazy because not only did it take over 30 years for those ideas from, I guess, again, the early 70s to uh, become popular and for people to build object-oriented programming languages that then became popular and then start thinking about building object-oriented software and come up with these software patterns. And those are the software patterns that people ask you about. What's a singleton? What's the visitor pattern? Um, and this is like, we're, we're so behind the curve. And the crazy thing to me is, if you look at a modern kind of small talk environment, uh, something like Faro, I think that's how it's pronounced, P-H-A-R-O, um, it's a fascinating thing. It's a file on your computer. You double click, a little VM essentially opens up and you get this small talk environment. And so many of those, the best ideas from that stuff got left behind, it seems. Like we took a very shallow take on object oriented programming. Um, there's so many concepts, like you open up a window in, in Faro or one of these like kind of small talk environments. The way they think about a GUI is different and much, much more interesting than the way we think about a GUI in Linux or um, Next Step, Mac OS, these Unix systems, or even in Windows. Um, like, look at Faro and look at what two GUI windows can do with each other and how aware they are of each other and what they're actually capable of doing. It's very interesting. Uh, Lisp, it's always on my list. Uh, if you haven't played with Lisp, go in there and play around. It's the gateway drug of computer science for a lot of people. It's like, it will blow your mind wide open. If you sit down and just grab a copy of the little schemer, it's like a tiny little book that will blow your mind. Um, it will teach you how to think recursively. It'll show you uh, how code and data can be the same thing, about how you can transform parts of a language uh, that you're writing in. Uh, it's incredibly interesting. And I think Eric Raymond said this, but it'll make you a better programmer for the rest of your days, even if you're not writing in Lisp primarily. It will change your thinking. All these tools and all these ideas, right? There are things that, ways in which we changed our thinking and the primary technology of, that we're dealing with, that you should be thinking about learning and dealing with is thinking. I'm getting a phone call. Hang on a second. All right. Um, you know, it's not a specific piece of hardware. It's a new way of thinking. And a lot of computer science is better, more clever ways of thinking about a problem or deconstructing a problem so that you can solve it easily. Um, that's the real power of all this stuff. And the larger ideas in computing, like the ones I'm going to name in a second, are all better ways of thinking about a problem. Finally, VMs and containerizations, just as another old school example. Again, an idea from the 1960s. Con uh, virtual machines, I remember becoming popular in the aughts, right? Almost 20 years ago, uh, taking the world by storm. And then after that, with Docker, this miraculous idea that, again, took the tech world by storm. Well, had anyone been <laughs> reading a paper from the 1960s, they would have seen that idea there and it would have seemed like, oh, okay, I understand what this is based on. The technology, the implementation is slightly different, but I understand what you might be able to do with this. Here are some more modern ideas that I think everyone should have a really good understanding of uh, if you want to work in tech these days. The first is distributed systems. Distributed systems have become feasible because of the massive bandwidth and low latency networks we have now. Um, instead of having one machine that has to know everything and do everything and the von Neumann architecture is inside one sort of metal pizza box in a rack somewhere, um, we've expanded our thinking to what if we write microservices, applications that are divided into many pieces and that pass messages uh, to each other over the network. It sort of harkens back to object orientation and the way Smalltalk did it in this like message passing architecture. Um, so you have that, but now 
it's across your data center. And now it's across multiple data centers. And now it's really across multiple points of presence globally. Uh, so you, the world is essentially your von Neumann machine. You know, storage and memory are, you know, you have persistent storage, you have like, uh, kind of queues for, for volatile memory. You have your compute is done on your instances. Um, but it's the same architecture, just translated to kind of a slightly different medium. And instead of a copper wire being your bus from, from one component to another, it's a TCP stack on one end, the internet abstracted away, and then another TCP stack on the other end. Um, but you see how it's, it's kind of the same, but different, but new. And it's less shocking if you understand the old ideas. The new ones don't seem that crazy or outlandish or complicated. They are complicated. <laughs> I'm not saying they're not, but uh, your mind can get wrapped around them a little better. Now you've got an operational nightmare. Operation stuff has always been procedural for the most part, right? You've been, your sysadmins have been writing procedural code, bash scripts, uh, more complicated bash scripts, Perl scripts to coordinate different kind of ne um, network uh, operational things, uh, host configuration, etc. Well, procedural doesn't actually get us very far without becoming a horrific nightmare in this environment. And so now infrastructure as code is a thing. Persisting your, your kind of operational state as code and manipulating it as code again. If you're into Lisp, this sounds really familiar already and you're like, oh, I have some good ideas for messing around with that. Um, suddenly, like the little schemer and some stuff you learned in there is a way for you to manipulate state in your infrastructure. Another idea that's definitely out there very loud right now is everything is managed services or should be or can be. Uh, there are some huge cloud corporations that would like everyone to believe this and outsource everything as managed services. Uh, they tried the, the no ops idea a few years back. That didn't fully take because I think people realized, oh, once I have managed services everywhere, then I'm my real complexity, my operational complexity layer is that cloud platform. And then I have to hire even more expensive operations engineers who are cloud ops engineers who are doing essentially the same thing at a slightly different layer of abstraction. It doesn't solve the problem, it just moves it. Um, but that's another huge idea. Uh, you know, like business people that like know nothing about tech and are cracking open their business magazines, like that's what's in there. That's what they're being convinced to do. You know, what's your digital transformation strategy? You can ask anybody that and uh, you know, you seem like you know what you're talking about. It's crazy, that's an idea that's being obviously pushed by massive uh, amounts of money and kind of a corporate interest, but it is definitely a, still a technologically interesting idea. Well, where does that move things when you, when, when everything's a managed service and you kind of push this operations thing to a new layer? Machine learning revolution part two is happening right now. The first one is in the 1970s. We have different statistical heuristic techniques. I'm not an expert now. We have way more cheap processing power. Um, we have way more data that we can use to train these models. So we are able to do things that people could only dream of in the 70s that were originally working on, you know, AI back then, now it's machine learning or whatever it's called now. So once you find some of these interesting ideas and there's one maybe that really interests you, how do you actually like dig in? Well, there is GitHub for all of your open source needs. Um, it's a great place to see real software being developed, how that works. The second place to look is research papers, academic papers. Uh, there's all kinds of super interesting research going on and a lot of that stuff, the output of that research is available for free. And if not, there's ways to find that on the internet. You can start reading academic papers and finding ideas that won't have kind of implementations for another five, 10, 20 years. I mean, you saw in the earlier examples how, how long ago some of these innovations or new ideas happened and there are still new applications being found. So if you're ever running out of ideas. Finally, sometimes the thing you're interested in is really mostly happening at one company or a few companies, a handful of companies, and it's closed source and it's just, you don't really get a lot of access from outside. Well, in that case, you should go maybe work at that company. Those three things are kind of what I've done across my career. That's how I think about how to find the best stuff in tech. Who really poured my heart out on that one. I feel very strongly about some of these things, as you can tell. That's been helpful, as always. Uh, like and subscribe. Uh, consider donating on Patreon. 
um, that really helps. And uh, remember, I have a Udemy course that teaches you basic Linux stuff and all kinds of fun, fun core skills. So if you're really new, uh, that's probably the place to start. Uh, cool. It's been fun. I hope that was useful. Peace.